<laughs> Thank you all for uh, coming to this afternoon's uh, seminar. I'm really excited uh, to be hosting our speaker today, the Murawski Lab, to be hosting our speaker today, um, Dr. Heather Leslie, um, my old boss, but also <laughs> really great mentor and colleague and uh, friend. Um, so Heather is a Libra Associate Professor of Marine Sciences at the University of Maine at their School of Marine Sciences. And she's also the director of their Marine Center there, the Darling Marine Center. Um, as the director of the Marine <coughs> Center, she's responsible for coordinating the courses taught that are part of the residential um, undergraduate semester by the sea program and also developing new educational opportunities for both graduate and undergraduate uh, students. She, a lot of this is copied from her bio. <laughs> Um, she is an international leader in marine conservation science, and she conducts research on the ecology policy and management of coastal marine ecosystems. I'm sure she'll be talking about a lot of that today. Um, Heather also co-edited a, co a book um, on ecosystem-based management with Karen McLeod, um, entitled Ecosystem-Based Management for the Oceans. Um, and in recognition of her work on communicating science and translating science into policy, and decision making, Heather was selected as a 2015 Leopold Leadership Fellow. Uh, Heather has taught courses in coastal ecology and conservation, marine conservation science and policy, and environmental scholarship and communication at multiple universities. She supervised 17 undergraduate theses, six graduate theses, and three postdoctoral research associates. She was the founding director of Voss Environmental Fellows at Brown University, and she recently helped found C Fellows. Science for Economic Impact and Application at University of Maine. Um, so she's very committed to science education. And before joining University of Maine in August 2015, she was on the faculty at Brown University. Uh, she received an AB in biology from Harvard, a PhD in zoology from Oregon State, and was a postdoc at Princeton University. She's originally from Plymouth, Mass, and now lives in Maine. I think that's so that's a good coverage, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank so, you, Marcy. Um, it is my pleasure to have Heather here with you guys, with all of us today, and enjoy. And Heather, you're up. Thank you, life. Marcy. And thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really wonderful to be in Florida, particularly right now. <laughs> it's been gray in Maine, actually in all of New England, it seems, for the last couple of weeks. So. Um, I can't remember whose idea I was to come at the beginning of December, but whoever's, if it was mine or yours, but the, yeah, this was a very good time. Yeah. And, I, and I understand that this is the last day of classes, and so hopefully you're all in a bit of a celebratory mood. What's that? Yeah, no, you can start drinking. I'm not going to start drinking. I want to get through this talk. Uh, rapid, rapid fire. Um, so as, as Marcy, uh, said I, my research focuses on uh, both the, the management and the uh, ecology of marine systems. I'm going to focus today on one aspect of that. I'm going to talk about the work that I've been doing in Mexico for the better part of a decade, which involves collaborators from both the natural and social science sciences. And there's so many other things I'd love to tell you about. We got to touch on a lot of them in the discussion I just had with students, uh, the work we've done on ecosystem-based management and how it's translated into practice, the bioeconomic modeling that we've done based on our, our work with communities in Mexico. I, but I really want to try to tell you a coherent story today, and it's going to be a story about Mexico and end with where I think we're going in Maine, and hopefully in the TGIF part of things, we can get into some of those other, other pieces. So the story I want to tell you about Mexico today is first of all, why it is that I've chosen to work in the Gulf of California, off and on, and, and pretty steadily actually for the last decade. What is it about that place that makes it such a special place to study, and why I think it's emblematic of a lot of other coastal places that many of us care about, both from an ecology and oceanography standpoint, but also the human dimensions of those places. I grew up in a coastal place. I grew up in Plymouth, Massachusetts, as Marcy said. Uh, and as, as a uh, beginning biology major at Harvard, I was trying to puzzle out exactly how I could be most useful in figuring out how to sustain coastal communities. And I settled on biology. It was sort of biology or Russian history. And it seemed like the more salient topic when I was 18 was, was biology. But what I've come to uh, in the last 20, 25, 
plus years is that while biology is absolutely essential to understand uh, coastal ecosystems, and we could each put our favorite discipline in there, right? It's not sufficient. It's really through the blending of different fields, both natural science fields and social science fields, that we can understand the dynamics of these complex systems that so many of us call home and so many of us value. So I want to tell you a story of how uh, we've done that work of trying to better understand coastal ecosystems, particularly in Northwest Mexico, and hopefully get some conversation going about uh, what relevance that might have for the coastal places here and, and further north. So before I go any further, I want to introduce some of the people who've been most formative for me in the last eight years or so, uh, people who I've worked very closely with in the work that I'm going to present to you today. And I'm not going to go through each of them by name, but I just want to recognize that we have a wide array of expertise, both in terms of discipline, like I mentioned before, ecology to economics, anthropology, and interdisciplinary institutional analysis, which means basically understanding how uh, social groups form and sustain themselves. Uh, we come from many different institutions, <coughs> even different institutional settings. Not all of these folks are working in academic institutions, nor were they when we worked on this project. And perhaps most importantly, we have a deep investment in the place where we're working. So together, we bring well more than 60, 65 years of collective experience in the region that I'm going to talk with you about. So while I personally have, have not had the opportunity to live in the Gulf of California region for more than uh, months at a time. The colleagues with whom I'm working, those who are shown here and those uh, who I'll acknowledge at the end, together we have a great deal of experience in the region. I think that's really important, an important part of the picture. That not only do we need this diversity of disciplines, but also uh, local knowledge of what makes coastal dynamics work. So I want to talk today, as I said, about why we've chosen to focus on the Gulf of California in Northwest Mexico, some recent results from that uh, focused effort that illuminate particularly how communities may sustain themselves, uh, particularly focused on fisheries. And then I'll talk a little bit about where we're headed with this work in Maine. And before I forget, since Marcy brought up the graduate and undergraduate uh, opportunities at the Darling Center, there are indeed opportunities to be in a more cold water and cold weather environment, whether you're at the graduate or undergraduate level. And I'm actually recruiting right now both graduate students and postdoctoral students to work on this and related projects in Maine. So if you know of anyone who's interested, please let me know. So California, I'm talking about this area of northwest Mexico. Uh, San Diego is up, up this way, and Sonata is in here. The Gulf of California uh, is this entire region. Some people even count the Pacific side of Baja. Much of the work I'm talking about today focuses on Baja California Sur, which is the southern state, the southern half of the peninsula. The northern half is, is called Baja California, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with this region. And then we have Sonora, Sinaloa, and Nayarit. So together, this entire region contributes more than 70% of Mexico's fisheries by volume. It's an int incredibly important area in terms of fisheries production for the nation. Uh, it's also really important in terms of biodiversity. It's both uh, very rich in terms of fish species, marine bird species and marine mammals. In fact, one of the sw smallest marine mammals in the world, the vaquita, calls the Gulf of California home. And unfortunately, for a variety of factors, that, that animal now numbers less than 300. So it's an area very rich in biodiversity. It's an area that's also, as I mentioned, very important economically. Uh, as I said before, 70% of the, the the fisheries in Mexico come from this area, and most of the fishery, fisher, fishermen in the region, I think altogether they number well over 25,000 for the region as a whole, and about 8,000 for Baja California Sur in particular. Most of the people fishing in this area fish out of small boats known as pangas. So you can see this is a pretty low capital operation. They're fishing with hook and line or 
gill nets is shown here. Uh, they're often just going out for the day or for the night, depending on what species they're targeting. And in many cases, they're targeting many, many species over both the course of the year, but even over individual fishing trips, many, many different species are caught. And here are some of those species that are landed by fishermen, like the ones I was showing you there, uh, on the beaches of Baja California Sur. And you can see that they vary widely, uh, particularly in terms of life history. You have much more mobile taxa, the offshore taxa, like sharks and jacks and mackerel. You also have very uh, sedentary taxa, clams, scallops, and spiny lobster. So this diversity of life history is important in terms of understanding how the fisheries work. Also the diversity in the value of these species. We've collected data with fishermen from fishermen's logbooks and found uh, that by and large most of these species, they, they come on shore and they're worth about a dollar a kilo. The exception is spiny lobster, which is worth about $10 a kilo. At least that was the case when we had these logbook data about four years ago. So pretty radical differences, both in terms of the ecology and the economics of this species. The reason why I first, or one of the reasons I first came to work in this region wasn't necessarily the biodiversity <coughs> or the economic importance of the area, even, those are, even though those are significant factors. It's the fact that El Nino plays such a major role in shaping the oceanography and the ecology of the Gulf of California region. And you can see here um, two s snapshots of uh, sea surface temperature from La Nina conditions in 89 and El Nino in 1997. And you see not only radical changes in water temperature from one panel to the next, but also that there's a great deal of heterogeneity as you move through the Gulf. And in many ways, this, this oscillation that occurs every four to seven years, we see mirrored seasonally. So we see pretty radical shifts in sea surface and coastal oceanography the, co the course of one year. And one uh, back to later on uh, that relates to some of the bioeconomic modeling we did is how this seasonal variation actually seems to be much more significant in terms of Fisher's decision making and dynamics than climate variability. We've been trying to study ENSO effects on this system for the better part of 10 years now on the fisheries, and yet it's, it's really difficult to talk with fishermen about ENSO effects. It's a heck of a lot easier to talk with them about seasonal variability. And I'd love to talk with you my, why more uh, why about I th why I think that is and later on. Um, so what I just showed you was the physical variability, changes in sea surface temperature. Well, not unexpectedly, we see that also that fishery species themselves uh, respond to that sea surface temperature variability and the forcing it creates on prey populations, on recruitment dynamics. Uh, quite differently. So this is a schematic that synthesizes that information for uh, many different species throughout the Gulf region. So here I'm showing you the year after the El Nino event, so pretty much a, uh, a fast reaction one year after the event versus uh, seven or eight years we see lagged responses from the tax out here. And in some cases the effects of the cooling water excuse me, the warming water, the positive El Nino condition uh, is good for taxa, meaning that numbers of the population increase in abundance. In other cases, we see negative effects of ENSO conditions. So for instance, squid, uh, squid and shrimp either move out of the area when they experience ENSO conditions, they move out of the area, or there is a pretty immediate effect on recruitment in this r select species. In contrast, the ENSO effects on things like leopard grouper and abalone are much more lagged because that's essentially a recruitment channel. So it takes that long for the species to get to the size where they're recruited into the fishery and it's not until seven or eight years after the ENSO event that we see the impact of, of climate effects on these taxa. So the natural question for me, the reason why I was roped into the Gulf of California system in, uh, in the first place is I really wanted to be able to make a chart like this but for different people, for different communities. Uh, so not just looking at what's going on with the biology of these species or even the volume of catch, but let's think about what this means for communities that are down here 
uh, on the southern Gulf side versus what it means for communities that are up in Pacifico Norte on the, the north side of the Baja Peninsula. H how does this biological and physical forcing from climate variability then pass through to fishermen and fishing communities themselves? That's the long-term objective here. And to address that long-term objective, we've realized we need to understand the social dynamics just as much as we need to understand the ecology and the oceanography. So we've done a number of targeted uh, investigations using everything from ethnographic approaches, more anthropological approaches, to biological and economic coupled models, bioeconomic modeling, to bring together the social dynamics and the ecological dynamics. I told you a little bit about the biodiversity of this region and also the importance of climate forcing. Uh, from a social perspective, there's a couple really important things to know before I move, move on to some of the results. The first is that fishing cooperatives are a very important part of many of these communities. These men all belong to a fishing cooperative in a community called Agua Verde which can only be reached by boat. It's um, maybe 100, 100 miles north of La Paz on the Gulf side of Baja, but you can't get there unless you, um, unless you go by boat. And when you're there, you'll see that, that pretty much everybody belongs to a couple of different local fishing organizations or cooperatives. And they rely on these cooperatives to uh, get their product to market, to get their, keep their permits in order, and also to access subsidies from the state and federal government for gasoline and other critical fishing supplies. So in remote communities like Agua Verde, our working hypothesis is that they tend to be dominated by fishing cooperatives, by these local organizations. And uh, many of our results, uh, as I mentioned to date, they show that. Uh, in contrast, if you visit with fishermen who are living in La Paz, you know, much more of an urban center, you can fly in by airplane, you can drive to the, the tourism center in Cabo uh, by major highway. Their cooperatives are not as strong, not as higher proportion of fishermen working out of an urban center like La Paz belong to these local organizations. They're just are not the same incentives. They are able to uh, get access to permits. They're able to get access to capital in other ways than besides belonging to a cooperative. So this heterogeneity that we see in terms of uh, institutions and how people organize to catch fish, we found to be just as important in explaining the ecosystem and the economic outcomes of fisheries in this region as, um, as the ecology and the oceanography. And just a couple of examples of, of how we've shown that. I'm not going to show the equations or, or, or show a bunch of graphs, but I just want highlight the two bioeconomic models that we did that, that indicate this, this high importance of both the social dynamics and the environmental dynamics. The first was a study led by Sheila Walsh Reddy, who's with the Nature Conservancy and was a postdoc with me at Brown. And she uh, worked with data gathered by fishermen, logbook data, to investigate the impacts of catching a certain size of red snapper, of Wachinango. And she was able to trace from the fishermen's logbook data and other uh, ancillary data sources, she was able to show how fishermen's selectivity for plate-sized fish made a difference, how it both led to more sustainable fish populations and also higher returns for the fishermen. So here we're seeing a plate-sized fish. And even a few weeks ago when I was uh, camping on the beach next to fishermen further south from, from this community, we watched the fishermen sort, sort the fish by size. And by and large, they had primarily plate-sized fish. They also had some small fish and some big fish. But it was really the plate-sized fish that they were selecting. And that's because they bring a higher market price. So what we found through this bioeconomic modeling exercise that was parameterized with logbook data is that there are, in fact, gains to be had, win-win situations where Selective fishing leads to better returns, both economically and ecologically. In a more recent study, we examined the impact of climate 
variability on how fishermen make the decisions. And here, rather than the decisions of individual fishermen, we were able to capture the individuals of fishing cooperative leaders themselves. And we found, uh, based on data, both from the but also from further north, the more remote community where cooperatives are stronger, we found that the community that had stronger cooperative organizations was better able to control their members' effort. And not only did they reduce fishing effort under unfavorable fishing uh, or fish recruitment conditions, so they actually backed off on effort when climate conditions were not going to be in their favor, they did that in a species-specific fashion. So we saw much tighter controls on effort for, for more local, locally recruited species as opposed to more pelagic species. So you might ask, how in the world was this effect on effort able to be exerted? And I'd be happy to talk about that later if you're interested. These were two really exciting and uh, really elegantly done projects, in no small part because of Sheila's leadership of both of them, um, and also our involvement, the involvement of Sri Nagavarapu, who's an environmental economist then at Brown. Uh, but I was always a little bit dissatisfied because we were looking at just individual <coughs> communities. So while we were learning these really interesting things about how social dynamics and ecosystem dynamics together impacted outcomes for both people and the ecosystem, and then we show that with these elegant bioeconomic models and back it up with data, ultimately we were talking about the decisions of um, altogether maybe 500 people. So communities of 50 or 100 people choosing to fish a certain way, having these certain impacts. And I have always been interested in trying to have a little bit of a broader view. I think working at the community level can be, is really important, uh, particularly being able to work with community members as we have in some aspects of this project. But in terms of actually setting management uh, frameworks or uh, helping to guide policy, what is going on in one or two or three communities doesn't necessarily provide a generalizable course of action. So to try to hit a little bit bigger geographic scale um, and beyond, beyond those site-specific applications, we asked the question of how general are these effects? Can we really uh, make suppositions about how sustainable we expect a fishing community's activities to be based on its biodiversity or its institutional uh, archetype. To answer that question, we needed a theoretical framework and we needed a lot of data. And uh, we sort of stumbled into both. So I'm here to tell you that, um, as, as you all know, except maybe the person who admitted to not knowing anything and being a first year graduate student about hour ago. Um, your, 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 questions and your, as your, project, your questions and your project evolves and so do your hypotheses, right? You want to always approach your hypotheses in a robust fashion, but you also want to re revise them as you learn more. Uh, so what, what started essentially as, as my attempt to gather everything we knew about how Baja fisheries work then became the testing bed for asking this question of do social ecological systems connected to small scale fisheries in Baja vary consistently. So what we did through this project was essentially overlay all the data we had, the social data, the economic data, the oceanographic, the ecological data, all the data we had about fisheries in the state of Baja California Sur, and if, to make sense of them and to evaluate them in a common framework, we used Lynn Ostrom's social ecological systems framework. So I'm going to take a bit uh, of time here to explain what that framework is so you understand the foundation on which this work is built. And then I will describe the methods and uh, the hypotheses very explicitly and, and tell you what we found in answer to this question of how generalizable are these effects. How, how well can we predict the sustainability of different, different fishing communities? How many of you have heard of the social ecological systems framework? Okay, great. That's helpful, helpful to know. So um, as you can see from this slide, it, it comes from a paper published in Science in 2009. 
the paper is based on the work that Lynn Ostrom and hundreds of other scholars did uh, over 40 years time investigating how groups of people manage common resources, so not just fisheries, but also water systems and forests, for instance. Lynn Ostrom was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009, shortly before she uh, passed away, unfortunately. And what's particularly notable about her, well, one of the things that's notable about her receiving this Nobel Prize is, is that she didn't even consider herself an economist. Uh, she's really, she was a political scientist by training and worked a lot with scholars of every stripe. And yet her work on common resource management is so foundational now to how both scholars and managers think about these problems that it warranted the Nobel Prize. So we're building on a long tradition from the economic and political science fields, uh, one to which environmental scientists have also made great contributions. And this is essentially the framework that she lays out in that science paper. So I'm going to take a minute to go through it because it's what framed that data synthesis exercise I just mentioned. So social ecological system refers to uh, the boundary, the, the system within uh, which fisheries are operating. And there's essentially four dimensions or components that Ostrom lays out. There's the ecosystem, which in our case is the coastal marine ecosystem, how, and, and its, uh, its boundary is not dependent really on a fathom line or a political boundary. It depends on where fishermen go, how far offshore they go to catch fish in a particular place. And I'll show you what I mean in a moment. So we have the ecosystem. We have the dimension of um, the resource, the target species that are caught within those, that ecosystem. We have the fishermen who catch those fish, and we have the local institutions and higher level institutions within which those fishermen are embedded. Okay? And so these four dimensions, I like to think of them essentially as the structure of the ecosystem or the functional groups of the system for, for the ecologists in the room. Um, what's really interesting about Ostrom's work is not. Uh, is what, how these four dimensions interact. And that's this middle part, which we are just beginning to study uh, thanks to some new support from the National Science Foundation. But before we could study the dynamics, before we could get into what happens when someone catches fish, what does that ultimately mean for the health of that fish population and the revenues to their families and their community, we first had to define the structural elements of this so social ecological system. So that's all I'm going to talk about today, are how we quantify these four dimensions. And as I said, now we're starting to get into the dynamics pieces. So there's some jargon that Ostrom and others have adopted to explain this in general terms, whether we're talking about fish or forests. So there's the resource system or ecosystem, the resource units, the actors like fishers, and then the governance system. And the idea is that this can be not only usable for different resources, but also at different scales. This could apply to climate problems perhaps uh, almost as easily as it could to more local problems. So using that framework, again, which is well grounded in, in uh, economic and, and political science theory, we tested essentially two hypotheses. And these two hypotheses came from the more specific <coughs> investigations that I mentioned earlier. The first was that we expected that communities or regions within Baja California Sur that exhibited greater potential for sustaining their resources in the ecosystem dimension would also exhibit greater potential in the social dimensions. So remember, these are the two ecosystem dimensions, and these are the two social dimensions. And essentially, our prediction, our, our, our first prediction is that we expect to see a positive correlation. <coughs> and that's fairly reasonably supported by past work in many different fields. There's also some contrary examples, but it's a reasonable, reasonable working hypothesis that we can then bring empirical data to bear upon. Our second observation, based on the, data, on the work we'd already done, is that we expected to observe great geographic variation in the potential for sustainability. And that's essentially the, a, uh, 
shorthand for the, the observations I mentioned before with the bioeconomic models. We saw that some places performed a lot better. They got better economic returns, they had better ecosystem outcomes, and rather than working with an N of two or three, like we were able to do with those bioeconomic models, here we hope to scale that up and have an N of, of 10 or 12. So we tested these two hypotheses by bringing together data from many different sources uh, in a way that was consistent with that social ecological systems framework that I mentioned to you before. Um, and we did that through, through these five steps. I'm not going to go through each of these, but I want you to understand that there was a systematic method behind it. It wasn't just a lot of hand waving and squinting at maps. And there's 75 pages in the PNAS paper. If anybody's inspired to either read it or, or try to replicate it or put, point hold, put, put holes in it, I would be thrilled if someone would do the last one, because I think that's how it'll get stronger. The, the bottom line for the moment is that there is a systematic approach behind this. Um, one of the, the first steps on that previous slide is that we actually had to take those four dimensions, the ecosystem, the target species, the institutions, and the, um, the, the fishermen or the actor dimension, and we had to turn them into quantifiable elements. And as far as we know, nobody had done that before. There, there tended to be a lot of, there's been over 2,000 applications of this framework, but they've been largely qualitative. They have not been quantitative. But since we wanted to c compare among multiple communities rather than just telling a story about one place, we had to quantify those four dimensions in similar ways. So what we did was use the framework, okay? For instance, here is the, the resource system dimension, and Ostrom lays out all the elements or what she calls uh, second tier variables that could help describe that resource system dimension. Well, we don't have all these things for the fishery system in Baja, nor are they all necessarily relevant. So we chose a subset that we could get data for and that made sense for our system. And this was a, a based on some earlier theoretical work that, that Ostrom and Bizzerto had done actually specific uh, to coastal systems. So these are the variables that we used to, to parameterize each of these four dimensions for Baja California Sur fisheries systems. So I'll just pick on this one because it's oceanographic, so hopefully there'll be some, some questions later about this. Uh, for, the, for the resource system, essentially the space in which people fished, we had three variables that, or indicators that we could um, quantify. The first was system productivity, which we based on remotely sensed data on chlorophyll A over a 10-year time frame. The second was system size, which was based on maps that fishermen themselves and other experts drew of fishing areas throughout the, the state. And the third was system predictability, which essentially was a, uh, the variance of those chlorophyll A values, which we used as a proxy for primary productivity in, in the system. And you can see that there are other quantitative ind indicators that are associated with each of the other three dimensions of sustainability capacity. So one other input um, before I show you the results, I mentioned that fishermen themselves and other experts drew maps of, of where people fished. And this gave us essentially replicate units uh, with which to test, uh, test the theory. So here, for instance, in Pacifico Norte, this, this polygon that's in pink, this basically represents an area where people tend to fish the same way for the same sort of species and also are organized in a similar fashion in the coastal communities. This is a working map. It'll certainly be revised in the future. But through a series of systematic surveys conducted with 15 experts throughout the region, uh, we were able to come to consensus on this map. So an important point is that not all these fishing areas are of the same size. Some are much bigger than others. Some, uh, you can see people are going much farther offshore than in other places. The shelf varies in size throughout the state. So that's partially reflective of where the shelf break is and actually where the, where the, I think it's the 200 fathom line is. Uh, 
Um, and the other point is that this gives us, rather than a couple of replicate communities to compare, as we did with the bioeconomic modeling, we now have essentially 12 sets of communities where we can now quantify the four dimensions of sustainability capacity and then test our, our two hypotheses. As contrast, if we had tried to uh, work in another type of unit, one alternative would have been to use the five municipalities of Baja California Sur, but you can see that they don't really make any environmental or social sense. Uh, for instance, this municipality here, it includes both the Pacific Coast and the Gulf Coast. There's communities that are very large, communities that are very small. It's, it's not a coherent social or environmental unit. So that was why we went and mapped these, these fishing areas with the fishermen themselves, so we would have more coherent areas, areas where we would expect social ecological dynamics to be fairly consistent. <coughs> so this is the only results slide I'm going, going to show you, and it summarizes the output of that synthesis of those many different types of data about Baja fisheries and the test that we did of those two hypotheses. So just to remind you uh, what the two, the two tests were, the first was that we expected coherence between the social dimensions and the ecological dimensions of sustainability capacity. We expected essentially the colors uh, to, be, to be similar, uh, across, similarly oriented across the maps. Uh, the second test that we expected there to be geographic variation. The second hypothesis was we ex expected there to be geographic variation. And you can see that that is indeed the case. There's not uh, one color here. So I'm just going to go through what, what I'm showing you here. These are the four dimensions, governance system and actors, the two social dimensions. The two environmental dimensions are the resource units or fish and the resource system here on the far right. And you can see that the potential for sustainability based on these four integrative dimensions and the, and the quantitative data that we have for each of these dimensions indicates that there's both spatial variability, that not all of the coast is behaving similarly, and also that among these different dimensions, there appears to be higher capacity in some dimensions for a given region than others. So here the coding uh, the darkest color is the highest capacity for sustainability based on these integrative uh, indicators, and the lightest color is the lowest capacity. So just to look at that in a bit of a different fashion, I guess <coughs> this would be the second result slide. Um, if you look, for instance, it's at Pacific Norte, that far, far northwest region of the peninsula, this is just a qualitative comparison across these four dimensions. You see that the resource system is actually a fairly small value, whereas the governance system is a very high value. There's a, a very well-organized community, set of communities in this region. In contrast, if you look at Guerrero Negro, which is uh, actually just, just north of Pacifico Norte, you see a very rich resource system, a high productivity system, but f fairly low score for governance. The communities there by our quantitative data are not terribly well organized. So this lack of coherence across the dimensions is, is interesting. I don't think 12 replicate areas is enough to say anything definitive, but to me it suggests that there might actually be trade-offs, that it might be difficult to be at the maximum value in four different dimensions. And that's something that remains to be tested both in this system and our ongoing work, but so in the other places where we're, we're working on this question, these questions. So just to summarize this, the scientific significance of what, what I've showed you here, first of all, it's the first spatially explicit comparison uh, or application of the social ecological systems framework. As I mentioned before, it's been used a lot of times in a number of different fields, but it's tended to be used in a way that's very site-specific and not quantitative. So by putting uh, data behind the framework and drawing on theory to support our, our indicator development, we show how biophysical data and social data can better be integrated 
Secondly, we find that the potential for sustainability varies at a finer scale than that at which fisheries are currently managed. Many of the fisheries in this region are managed at the statewide level, so all 12 of these polygons, or even at the Gulf scale, that photograph I showed you earlier. So a much broader geographic scale than what these data suggest may be most appropriate. And finally, and this is certainly speculative and, and deserves further attention, the variation we see across these four dimensions of sustainability potential suggests where or how management strategies might be tailored. So again, if you look at, at Pacifico Norte and the strength in the governance system dimension, that's something we'd certainly want to hold on to. We'd want, uh, if we are you know, working at the state or the federal level, uh, as resource managers in Mexico or, uh, as, as is truly the case, working with our NGO partners in the peninsula, we would want to advocate for policies and uh, strategies that, that maintain this governance system, that don't degrade it in any fashion. In contrast, the resource system, it's, it's just naturally not nearly as rich as some other parts of the coast, and that's a lot less manageable than, than how people behave in the system. So I think by, by looking at this variation across dimensions, we might begin to get some ideas about what potential levers are for policy and for management. So just to turn a little bit to where this leads us in the future, um, it's certainly an open question whether these trade-offs among the four dimensions of sustainability, whether they're actually a generalizable phenomenon. And we have a team now that has uh, presence and, and strength uh, in Sweden and throughout the country of Mexico, um, also in the U.S. And so we're, we're moving toward a, a place where we'll be able to do this type of comparison across multiple geographies, not just in one I think will enable us to test this first question in a much more robust fashion. We're also very interested in getting to the actual dynamics piece and looking at what the consequences are of these differences in sustainability capacity for the actual interactions between people and nature, and specifically fish and fishermen in, in the systems where we're working. So we're going to test uh, what the impacts are of, of these differences for uh, sustainability outcomes, particularly those related to both human well-being and ecosystem health, and we're doing that uh, in, in more dynamic ways, using, for example, experimental economics games, uh, and also agent-based modeling. And finally, it's an ongoing question and, and uh, work of our group to figure out how to make this more useful. Uh, one of the pieces that's already been, been very useful and, and resonates a lot more than others, it's, it's not, you know, it's not this. <laughs> it's this map. This map uh, re reflects the reality that many people working and living in these communities see and so it gives them a chance to talk about potential similarities with communities in close proximity and also um, some sense of how decentralized management may play out. The National Fisheries Act in Mexico actually does allow for more local scale management, but to my knowledge there hasn't been really very many opportunities to take that on. And so uh, finer scale information like this could play a role in enabling that to happen in the future. And so uh, in terms of what this means for other coastal communities, and of course I'm thinking about my fairly new home of, uh, of Maine, mid-coast Maine, but also about the, the areas uh, throughout the Gulf of, of Mexico since I'm visiting, um, I think there's two kind of key messages that I would leave you with, and I'd be interested to hear your, your thoughts and, and whether or not they resonate. The, the first is, uh, when I think about interdisciplinary research, I, I see it very much as an incremental and uh, sort of there's, there's a need to, to try and try again and, until, you, until you succeed. And there's not necessarily one gold standard or way of doing it. So for a long time in this, this work in Mexico, we really focused on bringing ecology and economics together. That wasn't easy but it was a lot easier than figuring out how to enable anthropologists to talk to uh, oceanographers, for instance. Uh, so starting with people who spoke similar languages and had some similar intellectual interests and goals 
I found to be a really useful way. I've also found that um, working with people who were at similar career stages is a really important thing to do. They're often motivated by the same aims. And that's not to say that uh, you don't want some vertical integration and cross-pollination, but it, it helps to form a team when you're sort of all headed in the same direction. So doing integrative work, doing interdisciplinary work, I think is very much something that is a process rather than about product. And I'd be interested to hear what, what others think about that. That's certainly how I'm approaching it now, both in Mexico and Maine. And secondly, this idea of knowledge co-production. Is co-production, has anybody heard that word before? No, OK, great. So knowledge co-production basically means working uh, with people outside of the academy. So, which many of you are doing all the time, I know. Uh, or working with people in fishing communities, working with people on Main Street of communities like this. And not necessarily just bringing people data and analyses at the end of the project, but rather, uh, as I've been doing the last month, walking into selectmen's offices in communities like this and trying to explain how I think these fishing maps from Baja might be useful in Midcoast, Maine. And I don't have a clear sense of if and how they are, but I figure if I start asking those questions, if we can start co-producing the research question together, just like many of you do all the time with resource managers and, and others, uh, then you can get further and you're more likely to have uh, uptake and interest in the eventual results of the work. So with that, I'd like to stop for, for questions and comments and uh, acknowledge the many people and sources of support who made this work possible. And thank you for coming.